when I was a young developer, like I'm an old fart now, uh, like all I had was this crappy old Moore's Law, uh, right. which, was, right. you know, again, was like this extraordinary exponential, but like it, it's not the same exponential that we're on right now. What I think unfortunately is a contrarian opinion about software development, I think there are actually gonna be more programming jobs. AI has so quickly become an important part of our society, and as is usually the case with lightning fast technological advancements, there's been a decent amount of pushback. And a big chunk of that pushback is something we've touched on in previous videos, and it's the way AI seems to be taking all the fun stuff. Art writing, content creation. It's working in a space that mimics a lot of what we do because there were so many examples to draw from when teaching these models. But the real promise of AI was supposed to be in its ability to take the tedious tasks that we didn't really want to be doing off our plates. It doesn't quite feel like we're there yet, but it also doesn't feel like we're so far away. And that's because more and more, we're seeing the focus being placed on AI agents and improving them to the point where they can anticipate our needs rather than relying on our prompts. This will be another game changer. And to help us visualize this, I got to sit down with Kevin Scott, the CTO of Microsoft, to get a clearer understanding of what's going on with the technology and when we will see those benefits we've all been looking for. Do you think AI will get to a point where AI is so smart that humans truly don't understand what's going on under the hood? Uh, or are we there now? <laughs> well, look, I, I think in certain ways we are, although I don't think that that's any different from some other like really complicated systems that we built or like, you know, honestly, a bunch of complicated phenomena that we don't quite understand. So in my mind, like technology is always about like, is there a path to being able to debug it when it doesn't behave the way that you want it to behave? Right. And I think there are an increasingly good set of tools that we're developing to try to, you know, be able to characterize the performance of really complicated AI systems and to debug them when they, uh, you know, aren't doing what you intended them to do. We've been talking for years and years and years about full stack developers or, uh, you know, developers who can understand systems from top to bottom. And I think you still need that a lot. Like, you know, you, you will be more successful as a developer in the age of agentic AI, uh, like in this era where you're using AI to do uh, significant parts of your software development job. If you understand that full system so that when it misbehaves, you're like, okay, like I'm going to punch down a level of abstraction and like go, you know, try to investigate what's going on here. And then like, I, you know, if that doesn't do the trick like another one and another one and like eventually getting all the way down to bare metal. Right, right. Kevin brings up a really interesting concept for the inevitable evolution of the software engineer or coder. AI made it seem like these jobs were going to disappear, but Hearing Kevin talk about it, it looks like they'll actually be needed more than ever. Instead of sitting and manually typing code, AI will handle the heavy lifting, but there's always going to be a need for more of a caretaker role or someone who understands from top to bottom what's going on with the technology and how to address any problems that may pop up or anytime the technology misbehaves. So it won't necessarily eliminate the job, it'll more change the way it's performed, but only for those who have access to the tech and for those whose environments won't be impacted. You have to make sure that as the AI demand is growing, things are getting cheaper. Like right. that's the way to make them more accessible. You have to make them e efficient so that they, you can run more AI computations on a fixed power budget or a fixed hardware budget or a fixed you know floor plan budget that you have inside of a data center. We're doing a couple of other things that are interesting. So one is like, we've got this constant background threat running, uh, trying to figure out whether or not there are these sort of disruptive uh, efficiency breakthroughs. So right. like the transformer, for instance, right. uh, which is the foundational technology that all of these modern large language model AIs are built on now was uh, like one way to think about it is like it was a disruptive increase in the capability of the systems, right. but it was also a disruptive increase in the efficiency of systems. We're doing a bunch of basic computer science AI research on trying to find what those next disruptive things might be. That's the key here. It's almost the holy grail of how AI accepts accessibility can become universal while also ensuring that any negative environmental impacts can be mitigated. It's all about efficiency and it's something that's defined AI's progress so far. As we've seen huge leaps in the improvement of the technology, so have we developed ways of making it more efficient. Efficiency allows it to use less energy and it allows the hardware to become less expensive with the ultimate goal being that we will one day soon be able to host the most powerful AI models locally on our personal devices. We're trying to help the 
electric power industry uh, find new sustainable, scalable sources of production so that right. you don't have to live in a world where you like, act as if there's energy scarcity. Because right. like AI aside, like you, you actually do want a world where there's energy abundance right. uh, and then sustainable energy abundance. Right, right. There are major social unrest happening in parts of the world right now because we have water scarcity. Right. And there are all sorts of ways that you could solve water scarcity problems if, for instance, desalinization were cheaper to do. Right, right. But it is an energy intensive <laughs> process right now. And so it's too expensive and like too unsustainable to do. If all of a sudden you had an energy breakthrough where, you know, energy became an order of magnitude cheaper and, you know, orders of magnitude more abundant, then like you could go solve problems like that. Right, right. Maybe this sounds a bit idyllic for how things will turn out, but this is really exciting. If the fear is that AI demands an enormous amount of energy, then making it more efficient to reduce that strain just makes sense. But at the same time, if the technology is being used to help solve a lot of the world's energy problems and make AI a net positive for energy consumption, then we'd be on the road to a much better place. But the problem is there's still some bottlenecks, the biggest one being memory, and I'm not talking talking about RAM or memory like in your PC, I'm talking about AI's actual ability to remember what you've already previously talked about with it. Right now, a lot of the times when you're using an agent, because memory isn't as good as it needs to be, like it just hasn't remembered anything about your previous transaction. And, and it doesn't even remember much about what it has done itself uh, oh, in right. taking a sequence of actions to go solve a problem, which is kind of crazy. Mm. And so you spend a bunch of time like rebuilding state inside of these agents right. <laughs> uh, that you shouldn't have to if memory was functioning well. If you think about how your memory and my memory work, we have pretty good precision and recall, but it's right. not pretty good one shot precision and recall. <laughs> So if you ask me to go remember something that happened five years ago, I am not going to be able to just like that tell you exactly uh, right. you know what that recollection is from. But like I have a way to go get to it. It's like, OK, like I kind of remember that, like I can put it in context. Right. Like that's also what we need to do inside of these memory systems. So like memory in an agent isn't a database lookup. Right. It's like an iterative process uh, that the agent you know may need to do to get the right piece of information very precisely. I started this video talking about the importance of AI agents. And the reality is that agents will fundamentally change the way we work. The need for efficiency that we discussed, the solutions to the world's energy problems, these will inevitably be solved by AI agents. And you can think of an AI agent as like your own personal bot there to do your bidding that can go out on missions for you. And by missions, I mean like multi-layered, multi-step tasks all at once. Agents will go out, tackle each task, and then return when that mission is complete without the need for that same level of oversight that current chatbots require. But if their memory sucks and they can't remember what they're supposed to be doing or how they were supposed to do it, then they're not gonna be a lot of help to us. I have no memory of this place. So we have to assume that all of those bottlenecks of memory are going to get solved. And that's something that Kevin talked about is a priority for Microsoft. The hard things are like the embodied AI things. So like there's just a bunch of stuff that all of us have to do in the physical world, like, you know, do your laundry and, you know, like I can't get my kids to like put the dishes, uh, you know, take them from the sink and put them in the dishwasher. <laughs> really irritates me. I wish I had a robot to do that. <laughs> Unfortunately, I think those are like really hard technological problems where we're probably not on as fast a path to getting those right. embodied AI problems solved as we are with some of these cognitive uh, problems. I have a whole bunch of things that I wish an agent could go do for me while I slept, uh, where I could wake up in the morning and, you know, it's already started writing yeah. responses to, you know, emails that I need to like get right to first thing in the morning. The, the reason it hasn't happened so far is because you just need agents when they're taking action, like they have to be really precise. And right. like so far we've had kind of imprecise memory and, uh, you know, action taking. And then there's like stuff that I, 
you know, hope for. And they're just choices that we make as society, whether or not we get them. They're not right. technical barriers. So I wish that medical diagnostics uh, were more available to people everywhere yeah. over the next year. That like folks like my mom who lives in rural central Virginia and she may not have access to the same diagnostic medicine that I have access to living in Silicon Valley. Right. Like I, I wish these AI systems, which are already like right now, plenty good enough to help give a real boost to people living in rural central Virginia where my mom lives. Like I, I wish like we would get to more adoption of that. And right here, we get a glimpse of the utopia that AI promises, a world where we don't have to do the dishes or the laundry, where our emails are written for us before we even need to worry about writing them and where the sick are healed through advanced diagnostic and treatment technologies, all thanks to AI. But it really does feel like we're right on the edge of a knife, where it can go the way of the utopia and the ideal future we just described, or where those email writing AI agents have conversations without our knowledge and plot our eventual demise. But I like to be a glass half full kind of guy, and I think that things will turn out all right, in which case the healthcare applications of AI feel like a fundamental game Game changer. And it is something that we've explored in a past video that I did with Demis Hassabis, who echoed a lot of the same excitement. Well, it turns out that Demis isn't the only CEO who's hyping up the healthcare benefits of AI. I feel like what touches all of us is this challenge of can we improve care and reduce cost? Mm. There was one place where I would say this agentic AI has to make a real difference would be take one of the challenges that we have as a society right. and go at it. And I think we are at the verge of it. Like what Stanford University was able to do by just essentially for something so high stakes, right. like the tumor board meeting and orchestrate all these agents and then ultimately empower the caregivers mm. there, right? The doctors, the nurses, all the specialists to be able to have a more successful tumor board meeting and then improve care. That to me is where uh, I think these systems built, you know, and then made available can mm. make a huge difference. For those who don't know, that was Microsoft CEO Satya Nadella, who in the past decade has shifted a lot of Microsoft's focus towards AI development. The agentic AI collaboration with the tumor board at Stanford University that he mentioned is a potential massive win for both healthcare services and the patients being treated. If you're not familiar, tumor boards are groups of high-level, multidisciplinary oncologists whose job is to review individual cancer patient cases and determine things like cancer stage and treatment guidelines, a process that in some cases can take weeks. With Microsoft's new agentic AI orchestrator, AI agents with the same disciplines are being used to turn the lead time on diagnosing, analyzing, and coming up with treatment protocols down to mere hours. And this is awesome, a real world application where we're already seeing benefits and it's the first of its kind. But we've now highlighted a bunch of jobs that could be eliminated due to AI agents. So where does that leave us? The, the really, really blindingly important thing is going to be people who are really sensitive to the needs of their fellow human beings who are sort of thinking about like, okay, what are long-term needs versus short-term opportunities? How do I do things that are like legitimately and seriously in service to, you know, what society needs and like what the people around me uh, need and like the problems they're struggling with and the solutions that, you know, they ought to be looking for that they might not be because they don't understand mm -hmm. what the art of the possible is with you know, this new disruptive technology. Now, granted, coding is just one sector that will be disrupted by AI and automation. But Kevin's right. As these technologies see an increase in complexity and demand from everyday users, we're going to need more people behind the wheel. So it's not that there will be fewer jobs in the future. It's more that those jobs are going to change. In fact, Kevin Wheel, the CPO of OpenAI, he recently did a little fireside chat during Cisco Live. And during that conversation, he shared a really interesting analogy that actually resonated for me on how jobs will evolve. If people seen um, Hidden Figures, a bunch of that movie is, you know, you have these scenes where they're like doing longhand rocketry calculations on like big pieces of paper. And you look at that today and you're like, oh my God, we would never do that today. And I think five years from now, we're gonna look at humans writing code and we're gonna say similar things. You know, we just probably wouldn't do that today. Computers are better than humans at writing code. But by the way, rocket scientists 
and rocket science is still a hugely important discipline. We still have lots of rocket scientists and they're really important. We're still going to have engineers. Engineering skills are still going to be super important. It's just gonna be a very different world. And I think a much you know faster, more efficient, we're gonna be able to create more because of it. So I'm actually, I'm personally very optimistic. The thing that I'm really hoping for is like you, that we will have systems that are like reliably taking action on our behalf, that right. like we sort of have transitioned from this mode of, um, you know, you are having to sit down with these tools synchronously and like have a session with them to like, you really do say, go sort this out for me. It is just gonna be super interesting and fantastic and we're gonna discover a <laughs> bunch of problems uh, that we'll then have to go solve. And like, that's what my talk will probably be right, uh, right. like next year at Build is like, it will be immediately obvious, like we've got a half a dozen like complicated things about what I just described that we're gonna have to go sort out. And like complicated problems to go sort out is my favorite thing. Yeah, yeah. <laughs> Amazing. Well, thank you so much for spending the time with me today. I really, really appreciate it. Yeah, thank you. It was a pleasure chatting with you. Companies like Microsoft, OpenAI, and Google DeepMind are showing that agentic AI is the future. We're headed towards a world where our own AI agents will help us in our daily lives immeasurably. Now, there are still hurdles to overcome before we get there, and definitely some additional guardrails needed to make sure we don't stray too far from that utopia that we all want to visit. But one thing is for sure, the positive benefits are coming but not without significant changes. Changes to our jobs, changes to how we do them, and changes to how we interact with one another. It seems like the only thing holding AI back right now is us. And the way Kevin Scott sees it, we're going to need to reframe the way we look at AI and how we interact with it before we can truly see the benefits that it promises.